So we need to talk about industry, uh, and we're going to talk about several of those through this next uh, lesson, but um, we're going to start out with the railroad. So the railroad was probably the most profoundly impactful thing that we had done in peace, uh, during peacetime in this country. It was an amazing transformation of this country and what it allowed us to do as far as moving the economy forward. So the railroad, how it grows, in 1865, at the end of the Civil War, we have, we have 35,000 miles of track, and we know that three quarters of those miles of track were located in the north. So there was this deep concern that we needed to develop the whole nation. We particularly needed to bind the west coast to the rest of the country because there was this huge gap of undeveloped land, and the west coast was just kind of hanging out there. And the last thing that anybody in Washington wanted to see was for the West Coast to say, eh, I don't need to be part of the Union, we're going to secede and we're going to form our own country and California would fall back into that bear flag republic. Nobody wanted to see that. So we had to bind the West Coast to the rest of the country to make them feel included. So by 1900, 35 years later, we have 192,000 over that miles of track in this country. Huge building going on, okay? Washington definitely sees the need for a transcontinental railroad. Well, how are we going to get that accomplished? People aren't just going to go out and build a railroad just because they want to invest money in this thing. They're going to need incentive to do that. So government's going to give them incentive. They're going to give them land and they're going to give them money. There's 155 million acres of land given by the federal government and another 49 million given by state governments where the railroads run through. For every mile of track you built, you've got about 20 square miles of land. That's amazing. Um, and then the government would also give loans to companies. For every mile of track they built, they got a loan worth between sixteen and $48,000 to continue their effort so they wouldn't run out of money. They wanted to see this done. So there are two major companies that build the first transcontinental railroad. One is Union Pacific. They're going to build from east to west, and they're going to um, start in Omaha, Nebraska, and then build out to the west uh, to the finishing point where both lines come together. They're going to use largely Irish workers, gangs of Irish workers. Uh, there's about 5,000 Irish workers that work on their transcontinental ra railroad. Um, and they're going to build 1,086 miles of, of rail. They build about 10, they're capable of doing about 10 miles a day is what their turnout is. Now the Central Pacific is the other line. They're going to come from west to east, so from California inland. They have a little harder road to hoe here because they have to go through the Rocky Mountains and so forth in the Sierra Nevadas, and that gets dicey as far as laying down track, you can imagine. Lots more blasting, lots more um, reconfiguring of the land to allow for the track to go. Trains just don't go over mountains. Um, they're going to use Chinese workers, and they're going to build about 689 miles of track. The ending point is going to be a place called Ogden, Utah. And when they meet up, the two lines meet up in Ogden, Utah, they actually take a gold spike and they drive it into the ground to bring the tracks together. That gold spike today is on display at Stanford University. Why Stanford? Leland Stanford was one of the major financiers of Central Pacific, that company. Uh, he was the former governor of California, so that's where Stanford comes from. Uh, they, probably the greatest railroad builder in America was a guy named James Hill. Uh, he would be building another one of the um, uh, transcontinental railroads that would come along later on, the Northern Pacific. Uh, but James Hill was probably the greatest railroad builder we had. Now, the changes in the rail, because during the Civil War, the railroads were a mess. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the railroads, in order to get more people using them, the common man on board, they're going to lower their rates. Okay. They're also going to go to steel tracks or steel rails. Now, they were using iron. You could imagine how heavy and how porous and how weak and how horrible iron would be for this mission. But to use steel, which is lighter, stronger, more flexible, endures in weather better, steel was much better. So they go to a steel track, also boosts our steel industry. Um, and they also change to a standard gauge. That's the width of the track. Um, so the... <laughs> So um, the um, standard gauge is the width of the track, and what happens is that all the railroads had different widths of their track, and 
So if you got to another owner's track, you had to change cars. You had to unload your rail cars, and then you had to load your stuff back onto another car in order for the rail line to continue. Now, they also go over to air brakes, which means that you have a more comfortable ride as a passenger because the brakes previous to this were really rickety and they weren't very good. Uh, lots of accidents with rail cars. But the air brakes make it a more an easier stop and uh, more comfortable for the passengers. It also makes it a, a better stop, which is important. They also introduced the Pullman sleeping car, which is a very comfortable car to ride long distances in. If you're going to have a transcontinental railroad and the idea is to move passengers, you want it to be comfortable for them. So this unites the country by transportation. We no longer had to worry about wagons or steamboats and the river system. We could now go anywhere we wanted in the country by rail, practically. It increases our domestic market, um, so that helps the economy. We're able to move raw materials and agriculture around the country better. Immigrants going west were able to tr uh, travel easier across the country. And we also have to introduce time zones. The railroad operators realized that there were lots of wrecks happening because people didn't know what time trains were going to be arriving at different places. So they divide the country into four time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. And those time zones would be very important in the uh, railroad industry. Now, the corruption that exists in the railroad industry is huge. It's very widespread. What do they do? They do what's called stock watering, for one thing. This comes from the cattle industry. And what happened in the cattle industry was they, the farmers used to take their cattle to market, and before they were weighed in order to gauge a price on them, they would feed them salt, which would make them very thirsty, and they would drink all this water and inflate their weight. So stock watering comes from that term. This is what the railroads do with it. They talk about their their company in such a way that is so appealing that it boosts the price of the stocks to an unreasonable value. It's not a true value of what the stock is actually worth. But they do this by simply word of mouth. Um, people today do this on the internet. <laughs> the, um, they also bribe officials for passage of bills through Congress. They pool their rates, which means several railroad operators would get together in a geographic area and say, okay, we're going to just split the profits here uh, rather than relying on one company or the other. And that sort of drove down competition, but um, increased their profits, certainly. They were able to line their pockets. And they gave secret rebates. So if you were a frequent traveler, for instance, you would get a kickback. Uh, lots of politicians got these kickbacks. Uh, there were, sh there were um, bigger charges if you wanted to go a short distance versus if you wanted to go a long distance. So if you wanted to go from Chicago to California, you would pay a certain amount. But if you wanted to go from Chicago to Indianapolis, you would pay a bigger amount, even though it's a much shorter trip. This was uh, particularly important, those long, short hauls pricing. That was particularly important for people who were moving merchandise and goods. Um, they didn't like that at all. The Wabash case comes along in the Supreme Court because the states had taken it upon themselves to try to regulate the railroad. The Wabash case comes up in front of the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, no, 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 you can't do that. It's interstate commerce. It's between states. That's a federal regulation. You can't do this as a state, as an individual state. You can only regulate what's within your state, not states that, not with the, not connecting states. So what does the, um, the interstate Wabash case is going to lead to the creation of the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. And that's going to do, take away a lot of these things up here. No more bribes, no more pooling, no more secret rebates, no more charging long haul versus short haul pricing, that sort of thing. All of those corrupt things um, get washed out with the Interstate Commerce Act. It's going to curtail that corruption. It's also going to establish the Interstate Commerce Commission, which, whose job it is to oversee this. Now, different trusts are going to be formed in the United States. In 1894, the United States is number one among manufacturing nations. We really make up lost ground very quickly after the Civil War. And within 30 years, the U.S. Patent Office issues 440,000 patents. That's amazing. Um, Andrew Carnegie is going to be the guy who um, is really our steel guy. He is top of the steel industry. John Pierpont Morgan is going to be in banking. J.D. Rockefeller is in oil. And Cornelius Vanderbilt is uh, the railroad magnet, okay? Now, how do these guys establish their empires? Well, there are three distinct ways. Carnegie uses vertical integration. 
which means that he controls or monopolizes every step of the production process. So think of it as a ladder and Carnegie controls everything. So he's a steel guy, so what's he have to do? He has to mine coal. He has to transport the coal to his location to produce steel. He has to actually produce the steel and then he has to, make, has to transport it out to sell it in the marketplace. So every step of the production process is controlled by Carnegie. Okay? Now Rockefeller does something a little different. He is a horizontal integration guy. He takes one step on the ladder and he controls all of that. So his, he is much more geographically widespread, but he controls all of it. So what was his thing? He was into oil refineries. He would control a vast number of oil refineries. So that was the step in the oil production that he controlled. J.P. Morgan, he uses what's called interlocking directorates. Remember, he's the banking guy. So he would go to failing banks and he would put his people on the board of directors. But he would often put them on multiple board of directors so that the directorates interlocked. They all had common interests and that was to make him more money. Now, there are other trusts that um, develop as well. Now, steel really gets a boost because of what's called the Bessemer process, which was a process developed in England to take the impurities out of iron to make a better quality steel. So that comes along, really helps the steel industry. Oil in the 1860s really had minor uses. You used oil to turn on a lamp, so you needed kerosene, but you really didn't need oil for a lot of other things. And with the invention of the electric light bulb by Thomas Edison, the perfection of the light bulb by Thomas Edison, oil really looks like it's, it's not gonna have a use. And then all of a sudden, the automobile gets invented. How much oil do we go through now with the automobile? Um, and that pushes the need to keep oil going. Rockefeller's gonna control 95% of the oil refineries in the United States. Makes a bundle, his family's still loaded. The meat industry, there's a meat trust, and there are several other trusts. There's a leather trust, there's a sugar trust, there's a farming trust, there's all kinds of trusts. But this is the meats trust, and see if you recognize these names. Gustavus Swift and Philip Armour, still huge in the cold cut industry and hot dog industry. Philip Armour, or uh, Swift and Armour. Great stuff there. So, unless you're a vegetarian. And then they, these guys also bought into what's called the gospel of wealth. And that means that they had sort of a heavenly help, a heavenly hand reach down to help them make their wealth. So they felt they owed it to the general public to sort of pay that back um, and pay it forward. Uh, so what they do is they set up different, uh, Vanderbilt University, um, you have Carnegie and Mellon, Carnegie's also going to take millions of dollars and invest it into libraries all across the United States. Um, and this is how they pay back that gospel of wealth or their benefit to this wealth.